So the two lectures that I posted to Canvas, um, one was on beam bending plasticity and one was on strain gauges. The strain gauge one, I highly recommend you look at because it's kind of important for doing this beam bending lab. Uh, the plasticity one is uh, also up there and it's, it's good to know because I'll probably have something on that, at least conceptually in the final. Um, and it's also part of the homework that is due today. Um, so let's talk first about plasticity in beams. In beams. Okay, so I'll do this really quick, just kind of as a, as a review of what I posted in the lectures, or in the, in the notes on Canvas. Um, so when we start off initially with a beam in bending, let's just make this a three-point bending beam for now. Um, in the cross section of the beam, there's some stress distribution. This is our z-axis, this now the stress. Um, initially we say that the stress has some linear distribution in the sample, and so it varies. Oh, why is that? Super fuzzy and super washed out. This is... Is that legible? Okay. Okay. It looks like this. Okay. Um, so we initially say that there's some linear distribution of, of the stress in the cross-section of the beam based on the bending moment where here stress is uh, mz over i, or m is sigma i over z, where z now is the distance from the neutral axis. Um, here, in this configuration, there'd be a tensile stress on the bottom, and a, or yeah, tensile stress on the bottom, compressive stress on the top. If I keep deforming that beam, if I keep applying a higher moment to it, eventually, you'll start to get plastic deformation happening. So the plastic deformation will happen in some region like this in the beam. So it, this is particularly for this three-point bending configuration, uh, and that's because the moment, if you remember, is highest in the center of the beam. Um, but here, uh, there'll be now some distribution uh, in the beam Um, where I'll have, it'll be plastic at some point, um, elastic inside, and plastic again on the outside. Um, this is assuming the plastic and compressive yield strengths are the same. Uh, this now, uh, we're going to take a beat to this beam for simplicity in this analysis to be elastic, perfectly plastic. So our, our stress strain um, elastic and then just plateaus. This uh, is basically a, a 90 degree rotated stress in the beam, um, where here now this is some sigma y, that sigma y extends to some plastic distance zy uh, on both sides, minus zy minus sigma y uh, z, and then our, we can go through some analysis and figure out that the moment uh, in this beam relates to the stress. Uh, here, I've gone through the derivation for a square beam, or a rec sorry, beam with a rectangular cross section um, of width b and height h. Um, but the moment then relates to that based on uh, the relationship b sigma y c squared one minus. Uh, sigma y over e squared over 3 epsilon c squared, where here the one big assumption we came up with this in this came up with in this derivation was that the strain is constant. It's we we assume the strain is linear across the cross section. So even though the stress here plateaus, the strain is still linear across there. So the strain at some arbitrary point um, is equal to 
the yield strain um, at zy is equal to um, here c we're defining if this beam has a cross section b and h we're saying h is 2c so then c is just the distance from the neutral axis to the top of the beam um, so we took this assumption, figured out where zy was, plugged some stuff in, and you end up with a, a bending moment equation that's something like this. Um, if you then keep deforming this beam, do, do, do. so if I keep applying higher and higher loads, eventually I'll form something known as a plastic hinge. So uh, this is a pretty common feature in beams. So that these stress states or these plastically deforming states on the top and bottom will eventually then connect, and you'll get this plastic region in the middle of the beam, where then a lot of the deformation will localize around. Um, I don't have my paper clip, but in the lecture I'd, I'd shown a paper clip and, and bent it up and down and showed kind of that that plastic zone would localize. Um, here now, this happens when or I guess our stress state in the beam looks basically like this. So the whole, we assume now in this in the center region of the beam, the whole thing is plastically deforming uh, at some sigma y, and there's always some elastic zone in the center of the beam, in the neutral plane, um, but we assume that neutral plane basically shrinks to zero. So the this happens when our our zy is a lot less than c um, or correspondingly sigma y over e which is equal to epsilon y is a lot less than epsilon c based on the same relationship so that basically the this plastic height here the zy shrinks down to something close to zero relative to our h over two and the moment now in this part of the beam uh, is b sigma y c squared. Um, the there's a couple there's one more important point in this, and that's when plasticity starts in the beam for a rectangular cross section. So that's when our our plastic rate our plastic yield strain. Is the is the strain at the surface of the beam? Is the strain at the top edge? Um, when that happens, we can say our moment plasticity starts to initially happen um, is two thirds b sigma y c squared. So this is the moment that you need to apply to start in a rectangular beam plastic deformation. This moment is the moment where plastic deformation or a plastic hinge forms, and the entire thing is plastically deforming. Um, and then that the ratio between them um, is just three halves. So the moment that you need to apply to start plastically deforming the beam, say that happens at some m, if you apply 50% more moment for a rectangular beam, then it will start. The whole beam will plastically or be plastically deforming across the cross section. Um, I go through a bit in a bit more detail in the in the actual lecture, but this is just a quick review of the highlights. Um, cool. Questions on that? All right. So the other topic that we that I covered in uh, the lecture notes that I posted was on strain gauges. So that one is again probably a little bit more important for the for this beam bending lab. So strain gauges gauges. So a strain gauge now, as a reminder, is some piece of it's a it's a metal device which kind of has this sort of accordion pattern. Um, I think in the lecture in the homework I had asked this question about 
um, why it has why it has the behavior that it does. But basically, when you when you strain this thing axially, when you apply some axial strain, this directly causes a change in resistance in the material. So this is a, a property of metals. Why is this still so? Is this is this fuzzier than normal? This has got a blue outline. This is real weird. I don't know what's going on. Oh well. Hope, yeah, maybe it's just dying. It served as well. Um, okay. So, four strain gauges, basically, they work in determining uniaxial strain. So when you apply a strain along the axis of that accordion pattern, um, it causes a change in resistance in the material. That's a that's a property of the metal that's being used. Um, so chain delta strain equals delta resistance. Um, they normally combine those in, in what's known as, uh, uh, they, they combine them in strain bridges um, with other resistors in, in the series and then use that to figure out what the, what the change in resistance is because normally this delta R is pretty small. You don't actually need to worry about that. Um, Wheatstone bridges, that's the word I was looking for. Um, but what is important to know is that these only measure your axial strain. So this is getting put onto a surface in 2D. Um, so the actual strain on that surface is some gamma x y um, is some strain tensor. So there's an x and a y and a shear component. The strain gauge is only good for measuring this one component of that of that tensor. So because it can only sense strain in the axial direction, you only get um, this epsilon x component out. So in order to figure out what these other components are, you need to combine multiple strain gauges in a rosette. So um, for our strain rosette, normally these are combined either in, in a 0 4590 configuration or a 0 120 240 configuration, so each of them are 120 degrees spaced apart. The one in the lab is a 0 4590, uh, so we'll have one one rosette at, or one gauge at 0 degrees, one gauge at 45 degrees, and one gauge at 90 degrees, 90 degrees. Um, so there's the important equations to know here there's your strain transformation equation. So to figure out what the strain is in some arbitrary coordinate system, epsilon x prime, uh, it's one half epsilon x plus epsilon y plus one half epsilon x minus epsilon y cosine two theta plus uh, gamma x y over two. There's one half in there, yep, one half gamma xy, xy, sine of two theta. Um, so basically for your beam bending lab, uh, you use whichever bending configuration it is to know what the axial stresses are from theory. So you know there's some shear stress and some axial tension or compression stress from the bending and, and shear force. You then relate that back to strain so you're at, you can figure out what your what your strain state is at a given point in the beam based on your 3d hooks law equation um, so remember that 3d hooks law are epsilon x 1 over e um, sigma x minus nu sigma y plus sigma z um, so there's there's that relationship for each of the three directions and uh, gamma xy is 1 over g sigma xy. Um, so you know what the stresses are at a given point uh, and what the you can use those stresses to figure out what the strains are. You then take those strains and rotate them into whichever orientation your strain gauge is oriented at and then relate that. that that's your theoretical prediction. You relate that, relate that to the measurement that you're taking in your lab. Um, so hopefully you've all made some progress on that. Um, but this is, again, just the general, the general process for it. So um, 
for a 0 45 90 rosette if it's oriented in an arbitrary degree so or arbitrary orientation say this is a gauge a b c or 0 45 and 90 um, we can also look at this in our more circle space uh, draw a circle a very bad circle um, there's some C here now what this thing is actually measuring let's make this a little bit more circular sure that works so what your strain gauges are measuring now uh, in your strain space here these are if these are oriented 45 degrees relative to each other then in your more circle space your two theta is 90 degrees here you're measuring an epsilon a um, this is an epsilon b and this is an epsilon c so what it's actually pulling out is the position along your axial strain direction each of these gauges and sometimes it's interesting to try to go back or it's useful to try to go back and figure out what your principal strains are from here so there is still some principal strain one and principal strain two um, out of this strain gauge if you know what these three are you only need three points to define a circle so you can figure out what your center are what your center is uh, what your radius is um, and then from there figure out what your principal strains are so the principal strains epsilon 1 epsilon 2 uh, is here epsilon a is epsilon c over 2 plus or minus uh, 1 over square root of 2 uh, epsilon a minus epsilon b squared plus epsilon b minus epsilon c squared um, so these are if you know what for a 45 0 45 90 strain rosette if you know what these strains are you can figure out what your principal strains are from that and if you know that this or we're assuming that this is oriented at some angle two theta away from our principal strains or two two phi you can figure out what that phi is. Um, it's one half inverse tangent of epsilon a minus two epsilon b plus epsilon c over epsilon a minus epsilon c. So you can figure out what your principal strains are and how far those or what angle those principal strains are relative to your to your principal strain direction. What angle the rosette is relative to your principal strain directions um, yeah so this is kind of a another quick overview of the the lecture notes that or the lecture that I posted to, to canvas that one time um, last week I think I posted it on Wednesday Tuesday Tuesday okay is that sort of analysis required by our uh, for the lab, you don't need to be figuring out what the principal strains are, um, but uh, you do need to be doing these rotations. Yeah, this is sort of just a useful one to know and a nice throwback to, to Moore's, or sort of more circle, but in strain space. Cool. Other questions on this or maybe the beam lab? beam bending lab. Okay, cool. So, now we get to finally go into some fun stuff. So, today and for the rest of the week, I'm going to be talking about buckling. So, uh, this is a subject that I generally enjoy. It's a kind of a weird one conceptually, but it leads to some very interesting behaviors. So I'm gonna try to break it down with some simple examples. Um, I'll give you a general formula that you'll need for the lab this week, um, or today and for the rest of the week. 
And then tomorrow I'll start going into some of the theory for how we get to that solution. So I'm going to try going in a slightly different order than normal. I think for lots of the previous stuff I had gone through a lot of derivations and a lot of theory and then ended up at a final equation. This time I'm going to be giving you, well, background and then a final equation and then tomorrow we'll be going through the theory. So hopefully that'll be a little bit more approachable. Um, so buckling in general is an, what, what we're going to call an instability phenomena, phenomenon. So instability uh, phenomenon. So what that means uh, is when you, s this, is, this is purely a structural thing. Basically, um, when you have some shape, when you have some, some thing. So I went out and I bought some, some cheap uh, dollar store rulers. Um, when you have something with some stress state applied, basically, depending on how it's loaded, there can be multiple stable states that this thing can exist in. So if I compress this axially, it's, there's one stable state where it just stays straight. That one's, and I, it's taking axial load, building up that axial load, and there's another stable state where it pops into a new bistable configuration. So, can I, maybe we can see that here. So, I can be pushing this thing axially, um, and it's just building up stress axially in the beam. Um, and then, if the boundary conditions change, there's actually some other stable bent that this thing can pop into. So, this phenomena is actually itself generally reversible. So, so we think about this as, as an elastic instability. So it involves, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to define a word here, um, bifurcation, which means uh, it's going to be snapping between two different stable <coughs> states. Snapping between That, that snapping can happen quickly or slowly, depending on exactly what the boundary conditions are and how load is being applied um, and how what the Im initial imperfection landscape is. Um, but generally, this is, this is the word that we we'll use for buckling. It's, it's, a, it's a bifurcation. It, it snaps from one stable state to another stable state, or from one unstable state to a new stable state. Um, it's generally elastic. Um, but it can lead to plasticity because plasticity. So, and it's, it's very common for slender structures. So here, this is, this ruler is very long and skinny. It's a, it's a slender shape. Um, when I, when I compress it, when it goes in and out of this buckling state, um, it's able to just kind of pop back to where it was before, so I'm not actually causing it to plastically deform, um, but that action of snapping between different states um, changes the changes the stress strain or the load displacement response of this thing. So there's one kind of simple conceptual example that I'm going to show, um, which you're probably somewhat familiar with. Uh, to talk about that, that snapping between states. So I'm going to draw a diagram here. This diagram will now have um, two rods that are supported with a pin condition. Here, this guy will be on a roller. And there's then a spring between them. So here, this itself is, is some neutral, stable configuration. Um, but if I start pushing on it, if I start pushing on this top <coughs> beam, these rods will then go down some amount, uh, and the spring will get stretched out. So if I'm applying some force P. Um, eventually, when I when this beam is at the midpoint here, there's both 
compressive stress in these rods. So as I'm pushing this, these rods are taking compressive load and the spring is taking tensile load. It's getting stretched out. When I get to the middle of this beam, uh, that midpoint, then there's a whole bunch of elastic strain energy. When everything is aligned in the middle, there's a whole bunch of strain energy in the axis, in the in the beams in compression, and in the in the spring in tension. And so what that thing wants to do is then snap into a new stable state. So when I get past this midpoint, this will actually then pop into a new stable <coughs> configuration. Uh, rollers. Uh, this is definitely not all at the same length. Uh, or all of the same. Uh, this is some L plus delta L. <laughs> These are not the actual, <laughs> planks are not to scale. But here it'll, it'll start off at some distance apart. When I push it to some new distance L apart, everything is, is taking axial strain energy. And then eventually it'll pop into a new state down below. So it'll pop down into this new stable state. What we're doing energetically now is if I define some disflection W here um, or some displacement W, I can say now in terms of my energy landscape, U, with respect to W, if there's um, no displacement, this is some in some equilibrium state. So my energy here in this in this neutral state is, is zero. So it's just some some minimum energy configuration. When I start pushing this down, I'm increasing the energy of the system. And so I, I'm taking it from the stable configuration to some new higher potential energy configuration. Eventually when that's at some midpoint, um, this is in a new uh, it's it's kind of here in this new stable state or this new unstable state. So here, this if we define this to be one, two, and three, our state one is is kind of here at the bottom of this energy well. Our state two now, when it's when it's fully aligned in the middle, is here at, at the top of some unstable energy state. So it doesn't really want to stay there. It, it's energetically, it's, it's, it has a very high energy and some small perturbation will, will cause it to go off. Here, back at this other state, when it jumps to this other configuration, this is again a minimum energy state. So it's, it's the exact same configuration as this, just flipped upside down. And if these are p hinges, if these are pins, then there's no energy associated with popping into this other state. So this is now another energy minimum. And so basically when I, when I deform this structure, it's going to the top of some energy hill. And when it gets to this energy hill, this is now an unstable state and it wants to fall into a new stable energy state. So that thing is probably something you're all familiar with. Maybe you, not something you've thought about, but if you've ever seen pop lids, this is basically what's happening with a pop top lid. So here I have, I have a ball, ball jar lid um, when I push it, uh, I really should have gotten a better lid because um, there's not a lot of deflection. But basically, I, I can push that center part and it pops up to one state. I can push it down and it pops into another stable state. And I, when I push it back and forth, it's kind of popping between these two energy equilibria. So here, this bottom deflected state is stable. This top deflected state is stable. But if I tried to hold that somewhere in the middle, if I tried to hold it between those two states, it really doesn't want to stay there. It doesn't want to stay flat because that's increasing the strain energy of the system. So this is, this is what I mean when I say a, a bifurcation. So it's if we push some system to a new unstable configuration, if there's some other stable configuration it can go into, it'll rapidly pop or snap into that new state. So one of these pop top lids is kind of the, the perfect example of that. So um, there's one type of instability that we'll really dig into in detail in this class. 
um, and that's beam buckling or column buckling. So, uh, column or beam buckling. So this is also known as Euler buckling because the original solution to this was come up with in 1757 by uh, Leonard Euler, or 17, yeah, 1757 by Leonard Euler, the same guy with Euler Bernoulli beams. Um, and we'll see tomorrow that part of the theory we used for beam bending actually comes back here in column buckling. Um, but so this, this theory has been around for a long time. It's something that's very relevant for engineering structures, a very important consideration to make, because basically when you're trying specifically to build large skinny structures that are lightweight, so think skyscrapers or cranes or, or anything that flagpoles, anything that you want to be long and straight and tall, this sort of instability, this buckling instability is all of a sudden going to be your dominant failure mode. So it's no longer going to be yielding of the structure uh, like you have with, with smaller scale things or with shorter, stubbier things. Buckling, this, this sort of elastic instability is what really limits the, the structure. So here for column buckling, I'm going to define, basically if we, if we start off with some beam of some length L, like L and I apply some compressive force to it, it wants to snap then into a new stable state. So this is exactly this ruler. So I brought a couple rulers so I could pass them around and have you guys play with them. But um, basically when I, when I take this and I compress it, it wants to then snap into a new buckled state. And uh, exactly what that load is kind of depends on a few things. So um, I'm going to start passing these around now. Um, just pass them around as we go. So there's one main equation that you need to know for Euler buckling, for this column buckling, and that is your critical load. The critical load here that you need to apply to cause a beam to buckle is pi squared EI over KL squared. So this I here is your second moment of area. Uh, e is Young's modulus. L is your length. And now K pi is pi, uh, k is the, <laughs> try not to flex them too much or else they will break. Um, it's okay. They're only like 70 cents. <laughs> um, so, so k is, is an effective length constant. So effective length constant. So what that means, basically, oh, uh, the most important, one of the most important things to consider in oil in buckling analysis is what your boundary conditions are. So here, if I have a pinned pinned condition, so I, I I'm not holding these ends fixed at all, um, I end up with this sort of a deflected state. If instead I, I hold these ends fixed, a different deflected state. If I hold one of the ends fixed and the other free, then I get a different deflected state. And so all of those, there's, there's a few different ones, a few different major ones that I'll talk about. So um, the simplest one is if I have a pinned condition and a pinned condition. This was sort of what the analysis was originally done for. Um, I guess this isn't, but... Um, Maybe not here. Uh, this has some load P applied to it. So this is uh, pinned. pinned. The deflected state will then be 
something like this. So that's this general solution. That's this general deflected state here. Yeah. What is the critical? Is that like where buckling starts? Yes. Okay. So that's this is the axial load that we need to apply to start buckling. So if I if I just push on it a little bit, it'll just deform. It'll take axial load. If I push on it a lot, it'll snap into that new state. So that P critical is the load that that snap through happens, that that instability happens. And so tomorrow I'll actually go through the analysis for how we get that, um, hopefully systematically. Um, but here, this is kind of what you need to know for the, for the buckling lab that you'll be doing. Um, so the simplest condition is a pin-pin condition where you just have a free end here on the side. Uh, you can have a fixed pinned condition where one end um, one end is rooted into a wall. Um, this is fixed, pinned, and so here, uh, basically, this isn't able to deflect at all in that root. So you end up with something, a deflected state, sort of like this um, when you deform it. So here you can see that if I if I hold this end, you end up with something that looks sort of like that. So it's a zero deflection at the end. Um, or zero, zero angle at the end. Um, there's a fixed fixed condition. If I have two fixed ends, uh, fixed, fixed, um, and then that'll look something like this. This is not a very good drawing, but sort of the general idea. Um, and then there's a, a fixed free condition. So if I just have a bar that's free to move, that's then rooted into the bottom, then this will deflect out like that when I have a load applied to it. Uh, fixed free. So that K constant, that effective length constant, is all based on this pinned pinned condition. So for this pinned pinned one, this is, is a k is equal to one. And so this was this was the first case, the first general case that the solution was found for, so all of these effective lengths do this pinned pinned length. Um, for a fixed pinned length, um, that k is equal to the root two over two, or approximately 0.7. For fixed fixed, k is equal to 0 0.5, um, and for fixed free, k is equal to 2. So what you can kind of imagine, it's, it's probably the easiest. Condition. Um, for this thing, if I have... Um, uh, how do I want to draw this? Let's move this over. Fix free. Fix free. Um, you can kind of imagine that there's some other half to this beam here. So now on the top half, it's basically the top half of this um, of this pin pin beam. And so you see that same general deflected shape. Um, then on the bottom half, this is your, uh, this is the other half of the deflected shape. So then your effective length, the effective buckling length, is basically twice the original length. So 2L, um, or K, which is your KL. So this is kind of what the analysis was done in mind with. So this, this KL constant basically is is a fixed is a fixed factor to change what the boundary conditions are on this thing. Um, so uh, let's talk. Oh, I'm gonna run out of time. Let's talk really quickly about the beam buckling lab that you'll be doing this week. We can even pull it up. Teach 
Pushing. There we go. Okay. So, in this beam buckling lab, let's not do that. Let's just zoom into this. Um, for this buckling lab, you'll be <coughs> testing two different materials, a steel and an aluminum, the same 6061 and 1018 um, that you had been using before. Uh, there'll be three different rod lengths, so one short, one medium, and one long. And you'll be testing those in compression in an Instron uh, and looking at what the, the critical load is. So that, that P critical, where buckling happens, um, you saw that it was a, a function of I, L, and E. Um, you'll be looking at exactly how changes in material properties and changes in structure affect that critical load. Um, but practically, you'll be, and there's some, there's some theory in here, practically you'll be taking one of these columns, putting it in fixed grips, and then compressing it to failure. Um, in this one, so there's a general procedure. I had mentioned before, now we tried to segment up the analysis and discussion a little bit. So you see for the analysis, there's actually point by point what you should be including. And same for the discussion. For the discussion we're giving you, you should be talking about these points. Um, and then we're giving you a data sheet here at the end uh, for you to throw uh, your measurements into for each of those six tests. Um, tomorrow we'll go through some more of this column buckling theory, go into some of how that actually comes about. Um, la homework two, homework four? Homework four is due today. Uh, grab your midterms if you haven't already. They're up here at the front.